Star Wars, it's time for Star Wars. We've got more Star Wars coming for you. Hello, Interwebs. Yes, it is time for me to review yet another Star Wars property, this time Star Wars Visions. And I have to say, I was really looking forward to the show ever since I heard it was announced. Uh, this feels like a show that Disney and Star Wars really needs to be doing right now at this point in Star Wars history after the sort of bad taste, I should say, after the Disney sequel movies that they made and the sort of like weird place that the Star Wars franchise is right now. And for those of you who don't know, Star Wars Visions is basically a non-canon anthology series. Though I say non-canon, I'm sure if any of these stories takes off or characters takes off, Disney will make them canon at some point. Sort of like canon until we find that it makes money sort of thing. But basically an anthology series all given to different Japanese animation studios to sort of make like an anime version of Star Wars with each episode sort of having its own style, its own feel, and telling its own individual story to it within the Star Wars universe and really uh, very much giving it a sort of Japanese uh, sort of flavor to it which is kind of nice considering that not to say that every single one of these is based off of samurai films but the original Star Wars movies were based off of like samurai films uh, like the Kurosawa films uh, that uh, George Lucas was really into at the time so this kind of takes it back to those roots to a degree at least the Japanese roots even though again well a lot of these anthology shorts sort of do highlight that sort of those roots to a bit. Not all of them do, but it's kind of nice to sort of acknowledge the Japanese sort of uh, influence that this series has always had, which is insanely cool. But as I said, the, the thing overall with this was I feel like Star Wars has kind of lost its way, <laughs> funnily enough, to sort of use a Star Wars term sort of thing, but it feels like it's it, it's lost its way, and things like The Mandalorian and The Bad Batch and the second or the final season of The Clone Wars have started to, uh, to, to, like, bring Star Wars back to a sense of, like, oh, it's trying to do something new, it's trying to progress things forward, but it's still kind of staying in that... Um, kind of past of Star Wars and not really pushing things out into sort of new canon, new ideas. They're sort of playing with new ideas within the established canon that we already have. Um, and that's why I think things like the High Republic and the book series and the comics really excites me because that's sort of like, even though it's in the past, like way in the past, it's sort of a brand new canon they can do crazy stuff with. And while this show, Star Wars Visions, is all kind of still, for the most part, set in this sort of Empire uh, era of Star Wars, the sort of, you know, original trilogy. This does feel like it's at least Disney saying, do something new with Star Wars. Try something different. Try to say something different with this franchise that we haven't seen before. And I really kind of appreciate that, and I frankly think Star Wars needs it now more than ever. Uh, and I was just really excited to see this overall. And now I'm going to go through and talk individually about each episode really quickly and give my brief thoughts on each one. But just as an overall sort of look at this, I really enjoyed this series just overall. While some are better than others, I think each story is no less than good and always brings something new and a different flavor and a different look to the Star Wars universe. I think some of them, um, when they lean into like the lightsaber battle sort of samurai, like stoic warrior feel, and there are quite a few of those that do that. I think there's like three or four of these nine that sort of lean that way. Um, they do feel somewhat similar in that sense, but I think each one of them does a slightly different twist on the dynamics at play here that kind of intrigued me in each individual way even when they were a little bit samey. And then also the art style on top of that was really nice for each every single each and every single one of them. And I think each art style was vastly different from the next. And each brought their own thing to it that I just really greatly appreciated. So like I said, I think a, a lot of these do their own different things that I really, really liked. And But a few of them do sort of lean into that like stoic samurai warrior Jedi beating up the bad guy. But again, I think puts just enough twist on it to be um, interesting. But if you're someone who that can get a little bit grading on for, I would say don't binge all these. Save for them. You know, I'm someone who reviews these, so I binged them all in a row, and it did sort of grade on me a little bit. Um, but if you're someone who doesn't need to binge them all that quickly, so watch one a day. Get a little bite-sized taste of Star Wars uh, every single day for the next week or so, and I think that might be just a really enjoyable way to to uh, to feel these and to enjoy these. So overall, I think this is really great. I think this was a great series to sort of break out the mold. But let's go into uh, some individual thoughts on each episode. And I'm not going to go in full in depth because this video would be so long if I did on each of and every one. But I'll sort of touch upon each one and my my likes and dislikes of each of them. I should say the first the first episode, the duel, I think was a phenomenal starting place for the series. Honestly, they came out right out of the gate uh, punching strong because this was 
beautiful and gorgeous. The fact that this is mostly told in black and white, but the different colors uh, and lights sort of like sparkled up every here and there, and then obviously the lightsabers uh, from from there on um, were absolutely gorgeous and beautiful. I, I really like this. I also really liked that this was very much leaning onto like yes, this is very much Japanese influenced Star Wars. This is not like the Star Wars universe as you've seen it before. This is very much like this is a Japanese twist on the Star Wars flavor. Like for example, the light lightsaber that we see in this is like an umbrella lightsaber which is the most bomb ass thing I've ever seen it was so cool um, and we, and it seems like what I love about this one the most, not just the art style, because there's some great stuff in the fighting, like the fight through the waterfall and her stabbing through the waterfall towards the end. What I like most about this is it does have a little bit of a sort of tweak on the, uh, the sort of Jedi versus Sith formula. Like initially we get like a Jedi apparently who's going to save this town. He doesn't want to get involved, but he sees the Sith attacking and the Sith, uh, the Sith warrior just, uh, tears everyone down. Um, and the Jedi warrior seems to come in and defeat her and it, very beautiful and very well done. It seems fairly standard, but I love the twist at the end or towards the end as we see this guy has a red lightsaber and then he sort of opens up his coat and he sees he has all these kyber crystals and he just taken the kyber crystal off of the sith that he just defeated and so you get this sort of you're left with this ambiguous note was this just a guy who was a jedi who has been going around killing sith and just happens to have the kyber crystals and that's why his lightsaber is red just because he took it off of other uh sith um and and that just happens to be it. or was he a sith himself and you know i would have been surprised at the end of this he's just like no okay now i'm going to take over this town but he gives the, the kyber crystal to the little girl, um, which is interesting. So it was just, it was, this is what I love anthologies for, where it's like it tells a good story in its own right, but then it just leaves you a little bit of a nugget of an interesting question sort of leaning on at the end of like, hmm, I, I, there's a bunch of different ways that I could interpret this, and I think they're all kind of vastly interesting. So I really love that overall. So a great start. Episode two was Tatooine Rhapsody, and I have to say, this one was probably the most out there for Star Wars, and that's why I really particularly loved this one, because again, it also subverted my expectations. This one's story was about a, uh, you know, young Jedi who escaped Order 66 and joined a band, uh, like a music band, because he d wasn't a Jedi anymore. And he couldn't really be a Jedi. And so through some shenanigans with uh, Boba Fett and things like that, he and uh, Jabba the Hutt, he has to go and rescue one of his band members. And it, it's a really nice tale to sort of see something different within Star Wars. He has to get a sort of Jedi character, but it, it feels so vastly different to just sort of see like a Star Wars uh, rock band, anachronistic sort of thing. And I think that it particularly works here because adding punk rock to the Star Wars universe could seem a little bit weird uh, in, in like normal Star Wars, but having it in this sort of like anachronistic, uh, you know, anthology series really makes it work. And I love the bit at the end of this episode uh, where we basically have the character learning like, no, I cannot beat this through violence like the Jedi would. I cannot find the, the violent way through, but I can do this in my own way, in my own unique way, with my own unique voice. And he's still using the lightsaber. It's still the Jedi way of finding a nonviolent solution, but it's not in the sort of like doing it with a lightsaber saber way it's a doing it with by singing a band song and fucking kill, kicking ass with the music uh and i thought that, that was just a cool little subversion on that uh idea and that i think this one makes it really stand out Next up, we have the twins. Now, of any of the shorts, uh, if I had to pick one that I would be like, I want to see more of this and see more of these, this tale, uh, this would be the episode. I loved learning about these two Force twins who were sort of grown up in labs and raised to be sort of like twins of the Force and have been like groomed to by the Empire to make this galaxy or to make this planet destroying machine. And they can like put kyber crystals into the body and spin this whole thing. And I like seeing the one guy sort of going to the good side and the sister stay on the dark side. Um, um, and the sort of like twin nature of that. It, it's sort of like this episode in many ways speaks to so many of the themes that have been interwoven throughout all of Star Wars, like twins and, uh, 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 you know, the dark and the light side of two different people um, within a person, uh, you know, finding that sort of element of it. I, I loved all of that, and so this feels very Star Warsian in its theming, and yet the look and feel, this was simply gorgeous to look at, and the differentiation of uh, the different brother and sister who have been groomed for this, to the dark side, as opposed to, like, Luke and Leia, who are, like, sort of good, like, groomed for the good side for the most part, um, for the light, uh, but going over their own separate ways was just really interesting to me, um, and I could totally see myself uh, watching an entire series with these two characters in their journey, so I'm honestly kind of sad that it was uh, only this one episode, so maybe, hopefully, we'll see them come up again. 
Next up, we have The Village Bride. This one I have a, probably the least amount to say on. I like this one. It was sort of like a slower paced one uh, where we sort of got uh, two Jedi learning about different villages um, and different like weird cultures uh, out there on the frontier, which is interesting to me. I do like seeing different cultures and things, but the story just felt kind of like, yeah, this is nice and quaint for me. Uh, the art style was gorgeous on this one too, um, but didn't like knock my socks off overall. So yeah, this one was one of the weaker ones in my opinion, uh, but not bad. Again, none of these are any less than good. Next up, we have the Ninth Jedi. This one I also really enjoyed, but again, didn't astound me. For the most part, this one felt uh, up to a point kind of standard. It's like, oh, we have this guy who's making lightsabers, and he needs to bring it to these Jedi to, to get them there, but this is a young girl who doesn't really believe in herself or doesn't know she's a Jedi, or has Force powers, needs to get there um, uh, in, in his stead. Um, and I thought that that was all fairly standard, but I, what I did love at the end was the twist that all these Jedi were, in fact, Sith. Uh, and only one of them was actually a Jedi the entire time, and obviously the girl sort of stands up and, and joins and, and fights along with her master. Um, was really, really good, and I thought that that was really enjoyable. I do think this one a little bit overstayed its welcome. I think this one was actually a little bit too long for even how short it was, uh, because it was all sort of building to that twist that I enjoyed, but it, that that was the, the thing of the episode. Um, and the other thing about this is I did like the idea of the lightsabers uh, being colorless until someone's own true uh, identity revealed themselves. That's a cool uh, lightsaber concept that I actually would love to see brought over to Star Wars canon, that if you pick it up, your, bl red, your blade will turn red or green or blue based on your different strengths of the Force and also the length of the blade. Otherwise, it'll just be a colorless blade. Uh, I thought that that was a, just a really brilliant idea that this episode added. So cool lore stuff in here. And the story was fine and good, um, but didn't knock my socks off. Next up, we got T.O.B. 1. This one is very much just trying to be Astro Boy in Star Wars. Uh, it was very much like a young robot boy uh, learns that he has power and sort of grows up with this, like, kindly old man figure who uh, who just, like, teaches him the ways of being a Jedi without teaching him the ways of being a Jedi uh, on the nose and eventually having to go out on his own but still maintain that boyhood innocence and also still being uh, eternally a boy because he's a robot. Kind of like a Pinocchio sort of thing in there. And again, sort of very much leaning into Astro Boy both in style and, uh, and feel. And, I, I, again, I, this one was just a pure kind of blast and joy to watch. It was just so much fun to see this character just sort of running around and getting really excited about the Jedi, but his innocence ultimately uh, getting him and his uh, getting him in trouble and his master killed um, was uh, was saddening. Um, nothing revelatory, but just kind of a ball to enjoy. And the final fight was a, a really good time and, and very visually distinct. Um, and so yeah, I really I just like this one for the the happy go lucky fun energy that it brought to the to the episode. Number seven, we have The Elder. This is the only episode that does not take place during the Empire era. This one actually takes place during the prequel era. You have a Jedi Master and a Padawan. Um, and I have to say, I wish we had gotten more outside of the, the Empire's era. To be honest with you, the prequel era is my favorite era of Star Wars. It's obviously not my favorite. The prequels are not the best movies, but I love that era of Star Wars quite a bit. And uh, so I would have liked to see a little bit more there. So it was nice to sort of see at least one here. Um, and so that wasn't entirely preoccupied with the Empire. And I wish we had exploded, exploded that out a little bit more throughout the anthology. But that being said, this one was an excellent one to be done. Again, kind of a standard story, kind of what I was talking about, like a standard samurai story, like a master and his Padawan uh, sense, uh, you know, a dark warrior, Sith in this case, and have to go out searching for them. The Jedi, uh, the Padawan, the younger one, uh, eventually gets uh, drawn into the battle first and the master has to go defend him. Uh, so a very, very standard story in that front. But the characters feel very evoked, evoked very well and very believable. The Sith guy is so unexpected and strange and very, very scary. Uh, I thought the duel was really one of the better duels in this whole anthology. Uh, so while the story was standard, the way it was told and evoked was creepy, strange, and um, ultimately just really awesome to look at. And I like that it sort of touched upon themes of aging and death and how the way of the world is things grow old, things uh, you know get stronger, things uh, get weaker as time goes on, and everyone sort of falls to time in the end. Uh, so a really cool episode that, while not you know earth shattering in its content, was told brilliantly. Next up, we have Lop and Ocho. I actually really enjoyed this one conceptually and visually a lot. And I would like to have seen more of this story because I like this sort of flip-flop idea of we get a character who's like the adoptive daughter of this family. Initially, you think the father is going to be this big jerk, but it turns out the daughter, she's the one that wants to join the Empire. And I like seeing that the daughter, uh, when, you know, did the time jump forward, the daughter is very much like, we need the Empire for stability. Like there was, like, while she eventually turns overall evil at the end, I like that she had some 
reasonable reasons for wanting to join the empire. I mean, the empire is a fascist government and, and awful, but as an everyday citizen, you know, just trying to live their best life, fighting the empire is not necessarily a feasible idea for you all the time. Um, and sometimes you just got to live your life and think of your own planet and people, um, protect what you can protect. Uh, and I, I don't disagree. While I am someone who's like, yes, fight the empire, fuck them. They're awful fascists. I certainly understand that point of view. Um, and I really kind of like that. And I like the swapping of the dad and the sister as the sort of like sympathetic or the, uh, on the side of good character in, in the middle of this with uh, sort of um, the sort of bunny rabbit character uh, being the uh, being the sort of in between one. And I, and I thought that, that was very good where and also the art style worked for me, too, where this fell apart for me a little bit was how broadly it was drawn. Uh, and I think this is a problem I have with some Star Wars media in general is because it has this like light and dark side stuff to it. Things tend to be heightened to extremes which works when you're doing like fascism bad uh as a storyline but when you're trying to talk about these nuanced bits uh, about what this episode kind of touches upon like inner family conflict and uh you know what do you do do you fight the big empire do you sort of like side with uh just trying to protect what you can protect that's a very nuanced conversation and ultimately the episode just sort of goes like ah oh, yeah the sister's evil sort of thing and while there's some allusions in the fam to time like we're gonna save her and the dad saves her I ultimately didn't get the vibe that there was much good left in her, um, and it didn't really connect with me as as hardly as hard as it could have. Um, so I think ultimately, while I like this uh, one conceptually, I like the art, I like the ideas it display. I think a little bit in the execution was left lacking for me. Um, but that being said, this will this would be the if I had to pick another one of like where I would like to see this like another one where I would like to see more of the story uh, going forward. This would probably be my second one because I do like the concepts going on. In here and I would like to see them fleshed out quite a bit more. And then for the final one, Akakiri, uh, I also really enjoyed this one overall, but ultimately felt a little bit underwhelmed as it for with it for a finale. I would have liked a little bit of a stronger piece for the final episode of the series. But as it stands, it's a very good standalone piece. Very much like the first episode, this one felt like it was very much more uh, a not like the Star Wars universe with some Japanese touches upon it, but like a Japanese lens on the Star Wars universe. Like everything felt very Japanese uh, within this. And I, and I really liked seeing that sort of like relation of different uh, Star Warsian things to Japanese culture um, was worked really, really well here. Um, this one, uh, I, I also liked the sort of like hearing of the relationship between this young Jedi and this sort of princess character and the ultimate sacrifice that he has to make at the end for her to become a uh, Sith apprentice is heartbreaking um, and works within the episode being able to build it up so well very quickly in that relationship very quickly. The two side characters are also interesting too. I kind of enjoyed them sort of like bouncing off the sort of Jedi uh, stoic mindset that this guy had and sort of like uh, pushing him a little bit in that sense and showing how much of a good character he is so that when he does have his downfall later on, it is all the harder for it. Um, so this was a really, really good one, but a much more subdued story i think than uh most finales are and you know that can sometimes work but for me it kind of uh, felt a little bit too subdued to sort of like let me go out of this series on i would have liked a little bit more of a high to go out on for this this show not that i need everything to be bombastic but a little bit more of like an upper uh like ooh, i'm excited going out whereas this one I was sort of like oh saddening um, to go out on the series as a whole on. So it was a bit of a weird choice to end the series on. Also, in case you were wondering, here is how I would rank these episodes really quickly. Number nine, The Village Bride. Number eight, Akikiri. Seven, T-O-B-1. Number six, Ninth Jedi. Number five, Tatooine Rhapsody. Number four, Lob and Ocho. Number three, The Elder. Number two, The Duel. And number one, The Twins. Though I will say the top three, The Elder, The Duel, and The Twins, I had a hard time ranking because I really loved all three of them uh, for very similar reasons, to be honest, especially in the case of The Elder and The Duel, I thought were very, very similar, but uh, I, I had liked for vastly different reasons. Um, one, the implications of the duel and, and sort of like it's making me think about the vast mythology is probably what pushed it over. Though I really loved the creepiness and the thematics of the Elder quite a bit too. But the twins came out on top just because I thought that that was such a cool uh, visual style. I liked the characters and really I want just more of that story at some point because I just thought that that whole thematics and idea and the characters were kind of really interesting and cool and the visual style was just phenomenal but that being said at the end of this like i said as you can clearly tell i enjoyed quite a bit even the episodes that i liked the least i 
still enjoyed quite heavily. So Star Wars Visions is a great show, and I would highly recommend that you check it out. Um, like I said, watch every episode here and there, but overall, it is a fantastic series, and I really hope we get more of this, uh, both more Star Wars Visions, like a second season, or uh, just, you know, Disney being more and more willing to play within the Star Wars universe. Um, I think that that's what Star Wars needs at this point, and uh, I'm glad to see it here, and I hope that it continues going forward. But uh, beyond that, don't forget to subscribe for more reviews. I also have a main channel called Jesse Gender, where I do, like, video essay type stuff that is sort of more um, long form discussions. Um, and beyond that, uh, thank you so much for watching. I hope that you, as always, live long and stay sexy.